thank you. That, that's great. Um, I, that's a very nice introduction, Olin. Um, so before I get started, I want to ask, do you all see which slide? I'm on, do you see the right slide? Does it look right or are you seeing my yeah. presentation? Okay. I can see your presentation. It looks perfect. Okay. All righty. So, um, oh, I wish I was, I wish we were having this, uh, this uh, meeting in person, I must say, but um, you know, it's been uh, it's been really fantastic. I've enjoyed it, um, and I realized in the last breakout. So um, I always feel like, uh, or in this case, I feel like maybe the talk that I've made won't uh, that maybe I'm leaving a lot of things out. But I hope that we just use it as a basis for discussion. I'm happy for uh, you all to you know interrupt me at any time um, because there certainly are. A lot of different ways that uh, biophysical simulations can inform uh, computational virology. Actually, it should be virology there. Uh, so I just want to try to give a, a sense for some of the things that we've done and what I've been interested in. But you know, the the conversations can go many ways, and I think it's it's fun when they do. So, all right, let's go. Okay, so. Um, the majority of the uh, methods that I'm going to tell you about uh, use a technique called molecular dynamic simulations, which um, presumably everybody is familiar with. But I like to think of these te this technique as a computational microscope, um, where the idea is that um, we can now take uh, multiple different types of experimental data sources from different experimental techniques and combine them in silico such that we can create data-centric, highly detailed, three-dimensional models of, of living systems, essentially, but, you know, biological systems. And here where the focus has really been on, um, as I'll focus today on, on influenza, I focus, so we're doing a lot of work in SARS-CoV-2, I think is, um, you know, folks have mentioned, I've tried, I don't think I have a single SARS slide in this deck. I've really tried to remember, in fact, all that we've done in flu. Um, in any case, so, um, right. So what we can do is take these different, for example, structural data sets, but we can combine them with information from glycomics, lipidomics, and genomics to build these integrated models. And then all that we're essentially doing is approximating that system down to its many atoms we define a relatively simple potential function as far as physics goes, um, where we're just, this just describes the interaction of the interactions of all the atoms in our system. And then all we're doing is integrating Newton's equation of motion over time. So we're animating the classical dynamics of the system, but we do this in accordance with the laws of statistical mechanics. So, you know, what we extract back out can be directly linked to those experimental macroscopic observables. And this is why this is such a powerful technique, why it's so expensive and sort of why we think it's so much fun. So we run this numerical integration on these pretty big computers nowadays. It doesn't have to be, they're also quite powerful just on single desktop GPUs. But, um, you know, these, the big machines allow you to do really nice work, such as, uh, you know, construct and simulate whole viruses, which I'll tell you about. And so the whole thing that excites me, um, and I think many folks, is the possibility to now use these types of methods hand in hand with experiments to go beyond where we can currently explore with experiments. So to extend and augment the data that we can get. I think there's, there is a huge, there's many opportunities for um, not only these types of methods, but many other physics-based methods to intersect now with biology. And so I'll try to also touch on that at the end. Okay, so um, I was thinking, you know, I was putting this talk together. And so, you know, it's, I tried to be, um, I, I sort of was being a little bit more reflective because uh, actually um, this paper, so we were just talking in the last uh, breakout, uh, Paul was saying that he's been, you know, studying the flu, I guess, for over 30 years. And I started remembering um, when I got into the flu and I have to say it was, it was this paper here. This is one of uh, Sir John's papers um, that I, that he published when I was a postdoc. And this was really a life-changing event to see the structures that they resolved with X-ray crystallography at that time of a group one and one and a group two and nine, these neuraminidases. And what I found so fascinating 
was this possibility that there was this loop that they had shown, this 150 loop, that appeared to adopt different confirmations, you know, whether it was a group one or potentially a group two. And um, because I was excited because it, it hinted at the possibility that this was really a, quite a dynamical system. And, uh, you know, I was sort of like, I'm very interested in sort of the molecular dynamics. So we started working with it. And one of the things that we saw from our simulations um, was that this 150 loop, even though it was open in the crystal structure, we already saw evidence that actually um, that that 150 loop could also close uh, in the dynamics. And so, um, you know, this was just the, the start of what kind of has become, um, I won't say a love affair, but you know, it's uh, it, this was just the beginning for me of um, really sort of falling in love with the flu. And then, um, you know, then there were a, a lot of studies, a lot of structural studies, um, you know, typically uh, using uh, X-ray crystallography as the main method. Um, where they, you know, had been trying to understand the, the structure and the, the cavity shapes of these different neuraminidases, in part because one could think about the opportunity, I mean, one is interested, of course, in just like the general sort of uh, enzyme dynamics and so forth, um, but also, you know, it does touch on the possibility for therapeutics and for making selective therapeutics, um, which could particularly become important, you know, if, you're, if there are mutations and, and so forth. But in any case, so um, then there was a structure published um, a, a few years later, or a couple years later, where they showed that the H1N1 uh, pandemic uh, um, uh, strain of neuraminidase actually had a closed 150 cavity. Um, and it appeared to be the only group one crystal with a, a closed structure. And, but of course we saw this and said, aha, aha, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, let's see what we can do with it. Because, you know, I think, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, and maybe not everybody, you know, agrees with me, but, uh, you know, we're very excited about um, moving from uh, sort of our, our very important sort of static, but static uh, understandings of structure to try to, you know, get at dynamics. Um, and when we, when we simulated, so then we simulated a number of different strains of neuraminidase. We simulated one of the N2s, um, the Vietnam 2004, uh, sort of, I guess, more avian strain um, and so forth. And what we saw was that they, each of these neuraminidases have different propensities for having an open or a closed cavity or an open and a open or a closed 150 loop, where what happens is in, in, when, the, when the loop is open, there's an additional cavity that forms. And when it's sort of closed, it blocks off that cavity. But but so, you know, conceptually, we pref I prefer, we prefer to think of these, you know, remarkable enzymes and also in general molecular machines as having, um, you know, they have, uh, their, their dynamics are better represented, of course, by ensembles. And this links to their function and so forth. But when we took a closer look, one of the nice things that we found actually in collaboration with Robin Bush um, uh, was actually that there's, we, you know, there was actually a, a, one particular salt bridge in this 150 loop that appears to basically control the formation of that 150 cavity. Um, and so uh, if there's in, in any strain, depending on the strength of that interaction, whether it's a salt bridge or a hydrogen bond, that it, uh, it sort of modulates control of that area. Okay, so those are sort of like the earlier studies. And um, we did a lot of studies of just the, the single protein of both nerminidase and some of hemagglutinin just in sort of their isolate, sort of like an isolated, infinitely dilute solution of water where we set up, you know, we have the, the structures and it's just in a water box with buffer uh, floating around. But what we really wanted to do, one of the things I always really wanted to do was to try to, um, to actually simulate these amazing molecules, but in their more realistic uh, biological environment. So to try to move from single protein scale to whole viruses. And so um, that's, this um, was a project that required us you know, to do this, would require the development of new capabilities for all atom molecular simulation. Um, for example, tools that helped us build membranes and create these, actually construct physically these larger structures. Where what we want to do, so this is a cryo uh, ET image taken from Alistair Stephen uh, some years ago. So it's, it's relatively older data. 
but it was still useful for us. Um, we, this was a study started in like 2013, 2014, you know, where this is um, a picture uh, that they've captured of, uh, of, uh, of the virus. And they can, they can see, of course, based on the shapes of these different uh, sort of studs coming off of, of the virus, they can, they, they know if it's an erminidase, for example, or hemagglutinin. So um, this offered us the opportunity to, to, this was what we used as sort of the beginning model. And then we, we, we sort of created, we used our own sort of computational and mathematical tools to take their data as represented by essentially a sort of a, a very simplified point model where, you know, we know the boundaries of the membrane for a representative particle. Um, and, you know, we, we know the spikes sort of where they're coming out and, and we sort of, we can get the, so what it allowed us to do is to reconstruct the, uh, where we can put in these high resolution pieces of structures obtained by X-ray crystallography and cryo EM, but into these, the patterning and the density and the positions given to us by uh, tomography. And so um, this, uh, we were able to, you know, to, con to basically construct this. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just say one of the things, so we go from this sort of low resolution picture to, um, I think the animation will work. Oh no, it won't. To a higher resolution uh, picture where we have all of sort of the atoms there. And you can see how similar it looks in terms of, of the patterning of these. Um, I'll just mention, I mean, um, in terms of opportunities for physics, uh, there certainly is no, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for physics-based models, particularly I think where you have um, what I call uh, capability gaps experimentally. And so I, that's one of the things that I'm very excited about is um, you know, using computational methods to, uh, to, to, again, to augment and extend where we can go with experiment. And so there are sort of resolution gaps. I can't quite see my um, thing. There are these resolution gaps that exist uh, with, with experimental technologies where we can you know, use, you know, just as the method developers experimentally are constantly trying to sort of bridge these gaps, um, we can do the same with computational methods. And, and there's a lot to do there with ver using various types of physics as you go across these different scales, you know, going all the way from angstrom resolution to something like, you know, to actual like tissue type, uh, tissue type, and actually as I'll tissue scales. And as I'll talk about even uh, at the end, even for, for models that go much farther than that. Okay. So this is what our uh, particle looked like at the end of the day. Um, it it's about 110 nanometers in diameter. So just about, you know, it was again, sort of taken directly from the cryo ET. Um, you know, it had, uh, it had about 160 million atoms. I'm hiding water molecules. I'm not showing you, this thing is sitting in like a thing of water. Um, explicit water, and um, we then can anim you know we animated uh, essentially the atomic level movements according to the dynamic simulations, um, and so this has you can see um, how many HAs it has it has 708 HA monomers. I don't know why we put this in, in terms of the numbers there in terms of uh, um, the monomers instead of just counting trimers. Of course, you can see that these are all properly oligomerized as they would be you know for HA or the NA has a whole bunch of those. So I, I won't, if someone is, if folks are interested to know more about the computing aspects, um, because this is one of the drivers for the supercomputing folks, I'm happy to talk about that. But um, this is just to say these, these, these simulations at the scale are, are even still now only possible on sort of the world's most powerful supercomputers. So um, we work hand in, in glove with those folks to bring these types of applications to their new architectures. Okay, and so, you know, we sort of believe that if we really want to understand influenza biology, that we, we really need to make this move from studying single protein to getting to uh, the whole virus. Um, where, of course, we have, we have done a lot of work, we and others have done a lot of work at these single proteins, but we want to understand, you know, how do they actually, how does it change when they're in their more complex scenes, their dynamics and other features, and also, you know, if we want to try to understand emergent behavior, you know, we, we will need to be able to sort of cross these scales uh, more easily. So, um, I, I don't know if I really want to talk about principal component analysis, but we, we had to do, 
you know, in building these simulations and trying to analyze them, we did have to do a fair amount of work to convince people, for example, in my field, that what we would see in these bigger scenes wouldn't be some type of uh, artifact that you wouldn't see in a, in a smaller system. And actually, I think that whole concept is backwards, that uh, it, should be the, it should be the sort of more reductionist, uh, the folks taking more reductionist approaches that need to uh, sort of show that what they learn is relevant, but I guess um, maybe it, it probably goes in all directions. But so, um, so we did a, a comparison, for example, of what was the sort of structural space in terms of the principal, so we run these trajectories and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a lot of atoms moving around for many microseconds. Um, and of course we can do a principal component analysis with which is a dimensionality reduction technique that tells us, you know, what are the big motions that we're seeing. And you know we could compare that for the uh, for the the molecules as the dynamics that they have in the single system as well as in the in the larger system. And um, what we saw actually was that there was a broader sampling of conformational space in terms of the major motions that we saw in the whole virus simulation as opposed to looking at the single protein. And I'll come back to maybe why that's the case uh, in a little bit. So um, this, you know, we, so, uh, so some, a lot of the motions or some of the motions that we saw, we actually were very curious. To, so when, you know, when you're looking at these systems, there's, there's, of course, there's a lot of places to look. You have the active site of neuraminidase, which is of interest, has always been of interest and, you know, will probably always be of interest for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, we can look at the dynamics at that very local level. And of course, that, but there's also much larger scale motions also that we can see, for example, motions in the stock of neuraminidase and also in hemagglutinin. And um, I'll get to that. Um, so. I do have, yeah, I do come from sort of a chemistry background um, and I, we are interested in sort of in these dynamical simulations also trying to find, um, you know, as these proteins move, how do they change? How do their um, ligand or substrate binding sites change? Because they are quite sort of plastic or flexible. And when they do change shape, how amenable are these sites to, um, to binding new ligands? And so we can assess those types of properties also through these methods. And what we saw um, was that this is, um, well, this has been published by now, but um, this uh, crystal structure, uh, if you just took a slice through neuraminidase and you did this sort of like drug mapping or hot, we call it hotspot mapping, um, this is basically like the equivalent to fragment crystallography, where you have like a structure and you flood the surface of your structure with different organic probes. And then you basically see where things stick in order to assess the propensity of surface regions to actually bind uh, like ligands and other functional groups. So this is what the slice through the uh, neuraminidase protein looks like, where this is um, this is basically where oseltamivir would bind. This is a slice through that same protein, but taken um, through a different snapshot in the MD. And you can see uh, that, you know, I don't, I don't give you any idea. I don't, I, shame on me. I don't tell you any idea about um, how populated this structure is, but this structure here is, is one that we sort of get from a clustering analysis. And you can see how, how much this pocket has the ability to change. It's much deeper, this sort of invagination into the protein. Uh, and it, it, it does sort of present different opportunities for binding ligands, as you can see by these change of these sort of like silver, these silver balls. Those these silver locations are basically indicating where ligands uh, are predicted to have a high propensity to bind. And so, you know, this suggests that, uh, as of course now is a fairly well worked concept, actually, that um, structures that result from these dynamical simulations can be gainfully used to try to understand, uh, for first of all, to um, like when these new pockets opens, opens up, they can be drugged or they can be sort of uh, bound, you know, ligands can bind. I've always been interested in this mobility because I think it has something to do with the capacity of these amazing molecules, both hemagglutinin and neuraminidase to bind to these uh, sialic acid receptors, which are highly variable, heterogeneous, you know, heterogeneous, very flexible molecules. I think they, they also have flexibility and this um, could 
help how it uh, makes these encounter complexes, at least to start. Okay, and so, um, so one of the interesting things that um, we, we also uh, probed was the secondary binding site in NA. So uh, neuraminidase has the primary binding site, which everybody, uh, you know, is, is mostly everybody is familiar with. This is where, for example, oseltamivir binds, but then there is a secondary site, uh, which was mentioned in one of the talks yesterday. And, um, you know, this is sort of a, a long known site that has heme absorption activity, um, but it's sort of the, the interaction with the primary site and exactly its function, you know, basically that's been sort of uh, unclear. So, um, so some years ago, actually, we, we ran some what we call Brownian dynamics simulations. And if, with Brownian dynamics, this is just a different type of physics. It's basically, you, it, you're looking at rigid body diffusion. Um, so you have two two uh, sort of entities, and you're seeing it's you're seeing how they associate to form what we call an initial encounter complex. Typically, when we run these, we don't have any solvent there, so we have what we call a continuum representation of the solvent, and um, and so they run very fast. And uh, it's basically this association is primarily driven by electrostatic forces. Um, so we, you know, we, we ran studies where we compared the association or the on rates, so the kaons, uh, of, for example, sialic acid and oseltamivir to these different sites. And um, one of the things uh, that we saw from these simulations was that um, that the, the secondary site in avian strains uh, appeared to have uh, it bind faster to the secondary site than to the primary site for uh, for certain strains, or for example, for N1, but not N2. And we made these predictions about the propensity of these uh, sites to be bound. And then uh, a couple of years after that, the group of Mark von Itchstein um, uh, validated the predictions that we had made in silico, which was, it's always so fantastic to see that uh, predictions validated. Um, they did saturation transfer difference NMR, and they basically uh, confirmed what we had, what we had predicted. So that was really cool. Uh, this is a, a method slide on Brownian dynamics. Um, I don't know if you guys are going to make the, the decks available to people. I'm, I'm not going to uh, stay on this because I'm already at 22 minutes. Um, Okay, so what did we learn from our big simulations? One of the things that we learned from our big simulations was that um, what we, 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 ran, we had the whole virus there and we had ions in the water. And um, when we looked at where the charged species were going, what we really clearly saw, so this is a picture of neuraminidase um, in, in like this blue ribbon is neuraminidase. And um, we saw basically these, the, the animation wasn't quite supposed to go yet, but the, um, all the, the silver uh, balls that you see there, this is sort of looking at where um, ions in solution are binding. And what we could clearly see was that there was a path where the ions had a propensity to bind that linked very clearly and very specifically the secondary site with the primary site. And um, so, because we had always been interested in the interplay of these sites and actually in the functional balance of NA with hemagglutinin, which is like a whole other story that uh, I think is really intriguing. Um, we, we, you know, we came with the hypothesis that uh, it's that perhaps these receptors on the host cell that they're attracted first to this secondary site, which sits outside more on the surface of the neuraminidase protein versus that primary site is a bit more buried. And so, yeah, so the hypothesis is that, you know, it, as, as it's that, well, of course, we know there's multiple sites that can interact with these uh, uh, receptors on the whole cell surface, but that it would bind potentially here first and then sort of move um, into the primary site. Um, okay. And so, uh, I'm just going to breeze through. So in new work, so our first simulations that we had, oh, which was developed, they were developed a really long time ago, and they didn't actually have any glycans. And um, so I sort of am not, I mean, we, 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 we obviously we need to include glycans. And so these are really, uh, I think pretty much everybody knows, but these are, glycans are very important post-translational modifications. It happens in the endoplasmic reticulum, and they should be there. They should be there if we want to model them correctly. So, um, uh, you know, they, they are encoded by a particular sequence called a sequon. When you have this, uh, this sort of pattern, then, then they, the, the machinery of glycosylation kicks in. They come in many different types. So, um, 
They can be oligomanous hybrid. And sort of you see these pictures, if you're not familiar with gly glycans or glycobiotic, well, probably everybody here is in flu, but in case there's like people who are trying to learn about it, I'm not totally sure. Um, you know, they come in different patterns and they have different features and, and so forth. But, um, you know, glycans are a bit understudied, I would say, you know, relative to sort of proteins and nucleic acids. I think um, the lot, we need, there's, a lot, there's a lot to learn there. Um, but the wonderful thing about glycans is, so we've added it to our, uh, to our full virus simulations. Now we've added glycans and it is sort of, it looks to me, I always think of Christmas trees and ornaments coming off and it sort of gives the protein more pizzazz, if you will, um, but also is very important for function and also for uh, relation to vaccines and so forth, as, as probably many of you know. Okay, so there's many different things that we can learn about like from studies of glycans. These are just some different properties that could be investigated um, using our types of simulations. These are things that we can connect to, different physics-based methods can connect to. Um, and these, these sort of properties and functions link to concepts like viral fitness um, uh, and you know, transmissibility and so forth. So you know, there are these fundamental molecular parts that you know, drive, I think, ultimately these uh, properties at sort of at much larger scales. And so, um, you know, so we're very interested. And I think there's tons of opportunity uh, at the crossover intersection between physics and biology uh, and flu to, to understand better how glycans affect the pr protein dynamics, not, actually not only in flu, but like in, uh, and not only, in, not only in viruses, but also just generally. Um, you know, in flu in particular, we're very curious to know how the change in glycans, for example, in a particular strain over time, how that could change the interconversion between, or the balance, the conformational ensembles, if you will, between the open and closed states. Um, uh, and also, you know, there is this whole thing where the hemagglutinins and the neuraminidases are balanced, and it's a very delicate balance uh, between binding to and clipping off of um, at egress, right? So um, how, do, how do glycans affect that hemagglutin and neuraminidase interplay? Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're also curious to look at, for example, I, I don't have to talk about it today, but um, arbidol binding to hemagglutinin and this sort of transient pocket that uh, we now know sort of exists there um, and how that could also be modulated by, by glycans. Okay, there's just so many things. Um, and now I'm probably really out of time because I did want to leave uh, some time for discussion, um, but I'll say in a, one of the, another fascinating thing about these systems is how they have this glycan clock. And uh, this was a study that we did with uh, Jonathan Udall and um, Megan Altman. And what she, you know, she found was that you know, when, the, when these strains first jump into human, they're basically naked from glycosylation, right? But then every five to six years, they add, they add these glycans. They add glycans on hemagglutinin in particular. And it literally, if you look at these different strains, it basically forms like a clock. Um, where at first, again, sort of, you know, you, first it's introduced, you, you ramp them up and then, you know, then it just sort of the second wave, it just sort of, it sort of flatlines. Then um, again, with the 2009 strain, we introduced this new to humans and then you could already see uh, it was sort of following that. We thought that this might be the year that it would, that the HA would uh, be pressured to pick up another glycan. I don't think it's going to, I would guess it's not going to happen um, because of the low rates, but I don't know. But this, this was a prediction we made um, uh, a couple of years ago in that paper. Okay. Um, and again, I'm totally out of time, but, you know, it is very interesting that, uh, you know, that the hemagglutinins basically, they, they, they mutate to, uh, to introduce uh, glycan sequins uh, directly in the spot where the antibodies are binding. Um, and so uh, this, these are all just too many slides talking about how we've now added glycans fully to these proteins, uh, both for HA as well as for NA. I'm sorry, they go slow. And, you know, there's, there's always discussion about the microheterogeneity of these glycans and what, how that impacts and that's, uh, how that impacts the behavior. We can, we can discuss that if you want. But so we have that now for these strains, as I mentioned, we have the fully glycosylated systems and we have uh, looked at the dynamics um, 
you know, of these systems. And we're sort of analyzing how the glycans now change the properties relative to the baseline without any glycans, you know, so that we can try to understand what's going on there. I'm gonna press through that. And we see things like these glycans actually mediating more sort of direct, in, they, they, they mediate interactions between proteins on the surface of the virus that otherwise wouldn't be interacting. Um, this could stabilize clusters. Uh, it does all sorts of interesting things. One thing that we saw that um, in, in some cases, when it gets to a very particularly crowded spot on the surface of the virus, we actually see the neuraminidase head tilt. Uh, and actually, it can tilt. In the, in, and we see tilting more in the glycosylated systems where there's more interaction between the head, you know, the head units. But we see this tilting almost like a sprinkler head. It does, you know, most of the angles uh, are around a distribution uh, that are, it's not so extreme. But we do see some ex very extreme uh, angles. And here where there's actually interactions between the head of the, the underside basically of the neuraminidase head with glycans coming off of the stalk. This hasn't been published yet. Uh, this is all just stuff that we're currently analyzing. And unfortunately, because of SARS-CoV-2, we got completely, basically everybody who's working in flu in my group has now is working on SARS-CoV-2. So this data is just sitting there waiting to be mined. We have a second set of simulations <clears throat> where we introduced that Michigan, the Michigan strain where now um, the, 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 the virus has adopted an additional uh, HA glycan site on the top of the head. And, um, and neuraminidase actually loses a glycan. So, you know, I asked that question yesterday because we're constantly thinking about, you know, in the whole system, there is this balance of factors. Okay, I'm at 30, 32 minutes now. Okay, but I did just want to say something that came up. We had just a wonderful discussion in the last breakout with, with Paul and folks. Um, there is just, I see just so many opportunities at the intersection of course of physics with uh, virology. Um, I think two that I'm particularly fascinated by, and I think many people are, understanding better what happens to these viruses when they are in aerosols and or in droplets. Um, and that includes the interactions of mucins. What, what's happening? Are they giving some sort of protective factor and different kinds of mucins from different species? Um, Capicolor theory is something that uh, is a bit more physics-based or at least atmospheric chemistry slash physics. Um, these are physical models, but they're very poorly, uh, they don't appreciate molecular complexity at all. So there's a huge need to develop better uh, models for hygroscopicity. That's what this Capicolor theory uh, uh, relates to for droplets and particles that actually have more than just water or salt and water, because they do. When you get these viruses in these droplets or in these aerosols, you have mucin, you have other proteins, you have all sorts of stuff in there. Um, and so how does that actually affect these properties that will go on to really impact whether or not the virus is uh, sort of the longevity of the virus in these different environments? And also how that can be modulated based on the roles of the protein glycosylation of the virus itself. And then of course, there is um, so much to be done in terms of trying to understand the amazing and enormous range of conformational changes that we see in, for example, the hemagglutin and this beautiful paper also by Sir John sort of more recently um, looking at um, and trying to connect this type of data with more physics-based mechanical models, but that's really sort of informed by experiment in, in, a, in a sort of a really integrated way. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of these things also uh, folks in SARS-CoV-2 are now looking at with the spike protein, but you know, we shouldn't forget about influenza, even though we sort of have been terribly distracted. Okay, and I'll just end with that. So um, I have a terrific group in La Jolla. It's beautiful. I would love you guys are, you're welcome to come here. Um, I'm sure there's much to discuss. Jacob Durant is uh, really one of the heroes who, who worked very hard to set up the original whole variant simulations. It was a lot of effort. Lorenzo Casolino also has carried that work on. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry, I went four minutes over, but I would love to take questions and discuss. Great.